I'm going to start this conversation with somebody who's not very well known, uh, but who was thinking about this. Uh, so in 1927, Ivan Wallen published a book called Symbionticism and the Origin of Species, with to him symbionticism meaning the association of uh, eukaryotic cells with uh, bacteria. In fact, he was studying mitochondria and rationalized for one of the first times in history that mitochondria, because they divide by binary fission, are in fact bacterial derived. This was way before Lynn Margulis later popularized this idea. So he quotes in this book, because he derives the discovery of mitochondria to be bacterial link, that's a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms that cause infectious disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. So it's a very provocative statement and not one that I intend to, to back up in full today. But I think it showed us the first window into the history of thinking about symbionts and microbes in the origin of species. And if you don't know Ivan Wallen, you should. He's affectionately known as the mitochondria man for his early pioneering work on the um, inferences that mitochondrial bacteria derive. So what happened to Wallen? He was lost to history. And in the same year that Wallen published his book, Muller was publishing some of the fundamentals of his radiation genetics experiments in Drosophila, where genes were suddenly becoming the thing of heredity and the thing of evolution. And so Wallen kind of got lost to history, not only because of this pioneering work in genetics, but also Wallen claimed that he could culture mitochondria from the organisms he was studying. And this was, of course, later disputed and probably due to contamination. But he got a lot right. He just got that last thing wrong. History was really not on his side to pursue this as genetics takes off. And in fact, in 1937, you have Dobzhansky publishing The Foundation of Evolutionary Genetics. And look at the two titles of these books. It's almost as if Dobzhansky might have read Wallen's book or title and just replaced the word symbioticism with genetics. And we remember one of these books very well if you're an evolutionary biologist, but we don't really know about Wallen. So let's march forward a few decades. One of the reasons why nuclear genetics has been substantiated in evolutionary biology and the origin of species, there are a few seminal studies that have been done over the last few decades. This one by Coyne and Orr in 1997, where they show that the genetic distance between any two Drosophila species, no genetic distance at zero and increasing genetic distance on the x-axis, correlates positively with the amount of reproductive isolation with one being complete speciation. So that positive correlation really founded the principle that as populations or species diverge, they become prone to accumulating more reproductive isolation, and therefore there's a timing aspect to the speciation event. So this now led forth the mission to find speciation genes in the nuclear genome, the quest for speciation genes, one that's robust and very exciting. And this is a paper summarized in 2010 by David Presgraves, in which they've documented a number of different speciation genes across animals and plants. So this has been the large state of studying how species arise. And in fact, it's gotten to such an extreme that there are, uh, there's sort of an anti-microbe or anti-symbiont view out there on the origin of species. These are two quotes from prominent biologists. I know of very, very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation in a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do and in which those genes have been mapped, of course. And I don't think we have any evidence yet that there has been speciation caused by microbes and not willing to go that far yet. So what do we know about what a species actually is? And I think this is sort of the provocative question uh, uh, for our time in biology as we appreciate the role of the microbiome in what makes a species. So what is a species made of? Well, it's clearly made up of its genes that may be sex chromosomes, somatic drive elements, transposons, and all the good housekeeping genes, which collectively together form a nuclear genome. And that nuclear genome changes over time and can be disrupted um, by recombination, mutation, but of course it's principally vertically transmitted. This is not to say that the nuclear genome is not um, sort of unstable, that Clearly, we know that sex and recombination mixes up genes. And I want you to think a little bit outside the box about what the microbiome of an animal or plant means in relation to what the genes of an organism mean. So let's consider the microbiome as a collection of viruses, bacteria, archaea, yeasts, 
uh, organelles, if you want to put them in the bacterial group, and together they form a microbiome, some of which is also vertically transmitted, and it's an area we need to delve much further into, but also there's a certain amount of horizontal transmission that's a little bit unfamiliar to think about in an evolutionary context. Though I would wager that the same disruptions, let's say, to disequilibria or equilibria in the nuclear genome driven by recombination parallels the process by which hosts and microbes share equilibria, disequilibria relative to the amount of horizontal transmission, right? So horizontal transmission and recombination are both disruptive forces to breaking down the equilibria between genetic elements or genes. Okay, so here's what we know historically about the role of microbes in standard speciation uh, uh, studies. In fact, we can go back to Zabzanski, and this is a collection of his graduate students, and one of those graduate students is a female, in fact, the only female from Dubzansky's group. Her name is Lee Ehrman, and she's still a practicing biologist, biologist today. And she published uh, a study called The Microorganismal Basis of Infectious Hybrid Male Sterility in Drosophila polystorum, where she was able to antibiotically cure the hybrid sterility trait of Drosophila polystorum that her and Dubzansky had been working on together. Another female comes along. Uh, this is an early picture of Lynn Margulis. And she becomes a strong advocate for the role of symbionts in adaptation and speciation. But she uh, has uh, the unique merit of, I think, advocating an idea and building support around it. But there wasn't a lot of evidence to come with it. It was just sort of a statement about how she views the world. And I think that's where we are today. Of appreciating how important microbes are and what an animal species actually is. So if you look at the microbiome across the human body, each particular site has its own distinct bacterial community. In fact, the principal factor driving the diversity of the microbiome is the location on which you sample uh, uh, the, the microbes from. So for example, skin has a different microbial diversity than the genital tract, than the gut, uh, than, the, than the lungs. But together, if you were to sum up all of the genes in the microbiome and compare that to the number of genes in the human genome, we're talking about 8 million genes that are potentially useful to the human function, in contrast to 20,000 genes in the human genome. So there's 400-fold greater genetic capacity, if you will, in the microbiome than the genome. Can we think about this capacity as a, as a sort of large super symbiosis, if you will, in which you extend the concept of the mitochondria being an ancient symbiont that is essential for the cell's function, now to the microbes in general, which are essential for the animal's function. And, and there are many studies that support this idea, but one could collectively call it a meta-organism, um, a super-organism, an organ, whatever sort of, uh, sort of jargon is out there, but I like the idea of the hologenome uh, because it encapsulates the idea that this is all the genetics of the organism. The microbes contribute genetics as much as the nucleus does. And that's not an idea that we're often um, uh, thinking about. So the idea of the hologenome has been proposed by the Rosenbergs. Um, they published a few studies early on in 2008, um, kind of laying out the concept. Uh, this term, the hologenome, actually originated way before uh, this particular publication. In fact, if you go onto YouTube, this guy, Richard Jefferson, who was a scientist at the time, talked about how PCR technology, this is amazing, because PCR technology was just getting going, actually will illuminate the complete genetics of an organism or the complete set of organisms that, that comprise one animal or one plant. He called it the hologenome, um, but he never published anything on it, um, but he does uh, lay the claim to sort of the first, first use of the word. A book came out last year, um, which I highly recommend by the Rosenbergs, called The Hologenome Concept, and it, it starts to push this idea and formalize it in the context of evolutionary biology. In what ways? Well, if we talk about canonical mechanisms of evolution, we think about maternal transmission. We think about genetic variation. Uh, we think about um, um, adaptation, speciation. All of that's covered in a way that is surprisingly um, comprehensive. And this initiative is sort of permeating through, through a lot of the life sciences today. This publication led by Margaret McFall and the guy and 26 or 25 other authors was sort of a manifesto 
to light up the, 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 the knowledge around how much we know about bacteria contributing to the function of an animal. Um, so definitely take a look into that if this is uh, some interesting or new stuff to you. So we've been thinking about a little bit about maternal transmission and how that plays a role in essentially vertical transmission of the microbiome from one generation to the next. Is that even a concept that, uh, that has been, exists in biology? And of course, we know that many endosymbionts and in insects, some of your colleagues study them here, have bacterial endosymbionts that can transmit it from one generation to the next. There's no dispute that this is a very common phenomena in the most abundant animals on the planet, insects. But if you start looking outside of insects, as we did in this review, we start to find evidence for maternal transmission in sponges all the way up to vertebrates, which was surprising to us. In addition, there's now increasing evidence that there's maternal transmission from mother to baby um, during the course or even before birth. So just to give you an, a, a sort of flavor of what our knowledge is about maternal transmission in humans, we've divided this into external transmission of microbes that occur from the outside of the body onto the baby, internal transmission being inside transmission. Um, so here's a little bit about what we know about that. So breast milk is seeding a large population of bacterial OTUs or species, if you will, to the feeding baby. Uh, vaginal microbes are an early source of colonization as the baby leaves and enters the vaginal canal. It's acquiring a large cocktail of its first microbes as well. But internal transmission is also showing up in some recent data. So the placenta has a microbial diverse uh, set of bacteria that actually parallel the kind of bacteria that live in the mouth. So perhaps there's some kind of blood flow route from the oral community into the placenta. There's also known cases of bacteria being in the bloodstream. And arguably, the sterile wound paradigm is just not correct. Um, in one particular case, there was a study in mice where they fed mice genetically labeled bacteria and did sterile C-sections on the mothers, these, these mice mothers, and sampled the meconium, the first poop of these sterile C-section babies, and found that the genetically labeled bacteria orally fed to the mother showed up in all cases of that particular mice's meconium. But in a control group where there was no genetically labeled bacteria added, that bacteria was not found in the meconium. So this would suggest direct uh, vertical transmission of the microbiome. Okay, so there's some significant evidence, uh, but it's an area that we need to delve much deeper into. Clearly, there's also horizontal transmission of bacteria. As we emerge into the world, we tend to accumulate most of our bacterial diversity. So for example, um, one could ask, is this bacterial diversity that makes up uh, this organism or hologenome uh, host-specific, or is it just random? So in a study of looking at the mice gut microbiome compared to the human microbiome, mouse in red, uh, human in blue, you can see that mice and humans tend to harbor similar groups of bacteria, known as the Firmicutes and the Bacteroides, but that the specificity within these lineages is actually unique to humans and mice. So as mammals, we tend to accumulate two predominant groups of phyla bacteria, but the specificity within those phyla are specific to the host background. Animals um, obviously vary among each other in their microbiome, so these colors just denote different types of microbes and their relative abundance. Human, mouse, fish are each different from each other. In a really elegant experiment done by John Rawls in 2006, uh, germ-free mice and zebrafish were colonized with the other person's or other animal's microbiome. And it was shown that the germ-free mice that took up a fish microbiome turned it back into essentially a, a mouse microbiome in a conventional mouse. And a fish also did the same thing when given the mouse microbiome. So there appears to be some kind of selection going on once the bacteria enter the organism that make this a host-specific uh, association. How do we begin to understand all this? Well, when we started to think about this, um, essentially there are two models here. Uh, one is akin to a neutral theory of assembly of microbes with host, and that if you look at the microbiome similarity against the host genetic similarity, if there's random associations and there's no host specificity, we'll see that there's no correlation between any two animals' microbiomes and, and their genomes. In contrast, 
if there's a deterministic assembly mechanism where there is selection shaping the host microbiome genome interface, we'll see a positive correlation between the microbiome similarity and the host genetic similarity. And if this is true, we should end up seeing co-diversification patterns where the nuclear phylogeny of the host species complex, this could be several species of the same genus, correlates with the dendrogram or the relationships of the microbial communities. Now, this is a concept of co-diversification that's familiar to uh, symbiosis folks who've studied bacterial endosymbionts in insects that are vertically transmitted, where the bacterial genome vertically inherited in the animal co-diversifies. It's a little different in the case of the microbiome, which is largely horizontally acquired as a vast diversity of microbes. And what we're doing here is creating a dendrogram or a hierarchical clustering of the communities and asking, is community one more similar to community two? And do they share 90% of their microbes? And then next, does this share 60% of their microbes? Do these share 20% of their microbes? And that's how we build that particular tree. We call that pattern, if it exists, phylosymbiosis. So let's This is how we're now thinking about speciation, not just from the genome perspective, but from a whole genomic perspective, where the microbiome and the genome could potentially diverge in tandem over a speciation event. So imagine an ancestral population that splits by allopatry into two populations that begin to diverge over time. And at the end of the day, when speciation is complete and reproductive isolation is developed, you have divergence in both the microbiome and the genome. It's possible that these species won't mate with each other because of divergence in their microbiomes. And they won't mate with each other because, in particular, the bacteria uh, are affecting their behavior to mate. So imagine, in this study here, Drosophila melanogaster. One Drosophila melanogaster strain fed on starch and molasses. These Drosophila melanogaster require different microbes in their guts based on their different diets. And now when you try and interbreed these particular Drosophila melanogaster, they can no longer mate with each other because the gut microbes have changed the pheromonal compounds for how these Drosophila melanogaster are discriminating against each other. So it's essentially turning one strain into two um, uh, divergent or reproductively isolated uh, uh, strains. Also, Wolbachi has been known to have an effect on the Drosophila polystorum case that we talked about with Lee Ehrman earlier, in which Wolfgang Miller has shown that Wolbachi affects mate discrimination of the subspecies of Drosophila polystorum. Post-mating isolation is when we get hybrid inviability or sterility. So here, these two populations will diverge, they'll mate, produce hybrids, but something will go wrong in the hybrids where we get inviability or sterility. So we have termed uh, this kind of phenomena uh, narrow sense or broad sense, in which in the narrow sense, you could get hybrid inviability or sterility solely due to the divergence in the microbiomes. The genomes play no role in hybrid sterility, for example. The broad sense model would be where the microbiome and the genome are essentially required to both cause hybrid sterility and viability. So we've been studying both these set called Nasonia. Nasonia is a parasitoid wasp. It parasitizes flies. It's a great complex to study interspecific differences in speciation because it diverged less than a million years ago, sometimes 400,000 years ago, with these three species. Um, Note in particular that the two younger species, Longicornis and Giraldi, would be referred to as younger, and the older species pair would be referred to uh, for Vitropenis and Giraldi. Um, these are two individuals that are mating with each other. Um, it's a little X rated, so close your eyes if you get a little nervous. Uh, but we have great genomic resources. We have thousands of molecular markers. This is the second best genetic system in insects next to Drosophila, and um, the, probably nobody's heard about it, or very few people have heard about it. Uh, we can now do germ-free rearing, and they are easily maintained in the lab. So what you're seeing here is the male attempting to court the female. Uh, he is spreading his pheromones over her face. He's spitting at her. He's swinging his antenna, and then she'll show receptivity by opening up her abdomen. She stands still with her antenna down. Uh, the male will then mate for just a few seconds, and he's not done yet. He actually has to go back and say goodbye with another courtship display. So they're pretty cute. They're perfectionally or commonly known as jewel wasps because they're quite metallic in color. Okay. So Nasoni is a parasitoid.
wasp. It's not easy to work with these things because you do have to work with the host. So this is the blowfly or flesh fly host, Sarcophaga gulata. Uh, sarcophaga love to lay their eggs on carcasses. We simulate that with uh, meat delivered from the local meat packing company. Uh, they lay their eggs on the liver. Those eggs will develop into maggots that are uh, uh, probably about an inch in, in length. Uh, they will pupate, and that's when the Nasonia will parasitize them. The Nasonia mother will come in. She'll use an ovipositor organ to deposit her offspring into the developing uh, fly pupae. The development of the fly pupae is paralyzed, so it'll stay still. These eggs are deposited. Those eggs will develop into larvae themselves, pupae, and adults. The generation time for Nasonia is two weeks. Um, they lay about 40 offspring per host. And um, it's exceptionally easy to collect virgins because you can discriminate males and females in the, in the pupil stage. So uh, Nasonia have a bacteria called Wolbachia that will become the first part of the, the data section for this talk. It's the narrow sense model that I'll talk to you about first. So Nasonia eggs uh, are populated with a vertically transmitted symbiont called Wolbachia. The Wolbachia in this picture are stained in green, and there's just a polarity to the Wolbachia, which they specialize towards the posterior end of the embryo. The rest of the embryo is dividing these blue chromosomes, or mitotically dividing embryo, uh, uh, chromosomes as the embryo develops. So with Wolbachia down here, this is not just serendipitous. In fact, the reproductive tissue cells, the pole cells, develop from the posterior end of the embryo because Wolbachia are transmitted eternally. They are already in the reproductive tissue area that would be developed as this organism develops. So Wolbachia by de facto then also are found in the testes. They're shown in red here and the blue daffy stain for the host nuclear DNA. We took thin sections of Wolbachia and um, actually we took thin sections of the testes and you can see these spermatic bundles here. The pinwheel structures throughout are the sperm tails or flagellar axis. And if you zoom in a little further, you can see Wolbachia snugging up around all these, um, all these structures. So this is a Wolbachia cell, it's about one micron in size. And inside that Wolbachia cell is a cocktail party of multi-critivage particles. There's about 60 of them here. And if you zoom in on them, you can see the standard mycosyl structure with the tail with potential tail binders to characterize the standard bacteria phage. So because it causes several fascinating reproductive alterations to their animal host. Um, one famous one is called cytoplasmic incompatibility. And this is a phenomenon where infected males cross to uninfected females to produce no or few offspring. The reciprocal cross is compatible, and because Wolbachia is maternally transmitted, the offspring can uh, get infected with the male. Both cell crosses are also compatible. So this is a unidirectional incompatibility because only one cross-direction is being found. Why would Wolbachia cause such a phenomenon? What it's doing is essentially encrypting the sperm of these males and rendering them incapable of going through mitosis in the fertilized egg. And this cross will suspend its development and die. Why? Well, if this cross dies, two-thirds of the offspring will now be Wolbachia. Previously, in this population, 50% of the individuals are Wolbachia infected. So every generation of Wolbachia knocks off the things of the uninfected females and rats its own frequency to a reach fixation in theory. All right. So this is what's happening in the first mitosis of the fertilized embryo. Late prophase, we have the paternal genome and maternal genome lining up. They're relatively uncondensed. To go through mitosis, they have to condense and tighten up. Prometaphase, you see the maternal genome condensing. The, mater the paternal genome is not. That continues in metaphase, where essentially the paternal genome, as the cell is splitting, gets shredded between the two dividing um, uh, sets of chromosomes or cells here. So this leads to the arrest of the embryo and death. Wabaki also cause a bidirectional incompatibility, where if you don't have the same strain in the male and the female, you have a reciprocal incompatibility. Both of these models of Wolbachia-induced incompatibility have been proposed as animal speciation mechanisms because they are essentially sealing off gene flow between host populations. In this case, one population would be isolated from another in one direction. In this case, two populations could be reciprocally 
sealed off from gene flow solely because of their Wolbachia infections. So what could Wolbachia do to the speciation process? Well, if we think back to the coin and ore relationship where genetic divergence increases with reproductive isolation and vice versa, um, there's a positive association there. But because Wolbachia could come in and spread rapidly, it could instantaneously push the speciation event to complete speciation just by invasion of these infections. And no genetic divergence is in fact required, right? This event could occur here and still push the speciation process to completeness if you have bidirectional incompatibility. So a while back, uh, and I won't focus too much on this work, we tested this idea in the Sonia species complex. So older species pair, younger species pair. When we cross them, the interspecific crosses are always shown in the middle. Okay? The self crosses are shown on the sides, and all the data is normalized to the self crosses. So the percent hybrids or the percent offspring produced is always higher in the parental crosses than in the hybrid crosses. When you antibiotically cure Wolbachia from these individuals, the amount of F100 production markedly goes up, and the specific crosses look fairly successful in producing hybrids, sometimes even more successful than the parental crosses. So what this tells us is that in terms of F1 hybrid inviability, two different Wolbachia infections in each of these species are causing a major incompatibility in the F1 generation that's solely responsible for the reproductive isolation. It's as if the infectious speciation uh, process has been launched without any genetic divergence required for this particular phenotype. And when you look at the older and younger species pairs, the older species pairs actually has an accumulation of reproductive isolation beyond just this F1 problem. So female hybrids can die, uh, male hybrids can die, there's behavioral problems. In the younger species pair, the two reproductive isolation mechanisms are Wolbachia again, and then a little bit of mate discrimination. So in this case, we have Wolbachia evolving in the earliest events of the speciation event, uh, where it can essentially be driving the speciation process without any significant genetic divergence or reproductive isolation. Cipient speciation by Wolbachia. So just to put this in a schematic model for you, imagine Geralti and Longicornis, which diverged about 400,000 years ago. Uh, they split into two populations. They accumulate different Wolbachia infections. Those infections then spread by unidirectional incompatibility, replace the uninfected individuals. And when these populations come back into the contact, at least in the lab when we make them, there's no um, gene flow or very little gene flow because of the Wolbachia infections. This is not the only induced isolation. So um, this is a more combinatorial uh, process in Drosophila reasons in subquinaria. Uh, work done by John Janicki's lab on mushroom feeding Drosophila. So you'll see here Drosophila recents on the east coast, subquinaria on the west coast. They meet in a hybrid zone in the northern uh, area of America or the southern area of Canada. And it turns out that unidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility occurs in the recent male cross to the subquinaria female cross. Fine, that's one cross of direction, but it's complemented by sexual isolation in which these females discriminate against these males. And then also both crosses have hybrid male sterility. This is probably the reality of speciation in which we see both genomic and Wolbachia isolation driving speciation. All right. Move on to the broader idea here of the genome microbiome interface playing a role in speciation. And I just want to return to this model of thinking about phylosymbiosis in the context of these predictions. If we see phylosymbiosis, we consider that a signal of deterministic or selection shaping the genome microbiome interface with respect to the ancestry of the. So, in, in other words, we'll have different microbial communities different genetic divergence across the speciation of that. And within each species, the microbiome and the genome are in some kind of relative homeostasis. That is, the genome has evolved, let's say, an immune system to handle the resident microbiome, and the resident microbiome may prefer to infect a certain host species, creating this specificity. So what happens if you hybridize these species? Well, in a very simplistic view of this, you can have essentially two types of interactions. Uh, you can have an autoimmune response where the genomes now hybridized have a recombinogenic genome that launches a hyperimmune system response and prevents beneficial bacteria, let's say, from invading this autoimmune or hyperimmune 
response hybrid. And not having the right microbiome could lead to lethality. On the other hand, you could have virulence where the microbiome goes awry uh, in these hybrids because the hybrids can no longer maintain the proper microbiome. And this leads to uh, virulence and potentially hybrids and viability or sterility under either of these models. The Nasonia gut microbiome, we uh, visualized it in hind gut, um, mostly gamma proteobacteria here, which tends to be the common phyla in insects. If you look at Nasonia drosophila and honeybees, they all have very large fractions of gamma proteobacteria in their, in their microbiome, the gut microbiome. Uh, humans and uh, mice tend to be in the firm cuties bacteroides regions. So even at this gross insect versus mammalian uh, microbiome patterns, there's some specificity in what types of microbes colonize these animals. So when we looked at the bacterial diversity in each of these three species, we did it in a developmentally staged manner by checking out the larval microbiomes, the pupil microbiomes, and the adult microbiomes. The number of OTUs just refers to the number of bacterial species we initially sequenced with saying you're sequencing in 16S cloning. The larvae have a simple microbiota with one particular species dominating it, so there are less of them. And the pupae and adult diversity increases or blossoms over development in a sort of microbial succession, if you will, throughout development. Moreover, if you measure the host or the fly pupa microbiome, it looks a lot like the larval microbiome. So perhaps the first colonization of these larvae is from the host that they're feeding on. That makes a lot of sense. But what's dramatic is that even though these species were all fed on the same host, they start to acquire unique microbial signatures in their, in their microbiome over development. So they're developmentally controlled, they're gender controlled, they're geography controlled, they're diet controlled. The null hypothesis might be that they should all have the same microbes, but in fact they have different microbes, and they associate in a phylosymbiotic manner. So again, here's the Nasonia phylogeny based on the nuclear tree. And then these are the dendrograms of the microbiomes from the Nasonia adults and the Nasonia pupa. You'll notice that the Geraldi and Longicornis microbiome is more closely related to each other than the Vitropenis. This is the pattern in the nuclear phylogeny. And we see it in a developmentally specific way. So as that diversity blossoms, it's still accumulating in a phylosymbiotic way. Uh, that was uh, surprising to us, but suggested that there's perhaps something uh, uh, interesting going on between the genome and the microbiome. And that brings us to the major reproductive isolation trait besides Wolbachia and Nasonia, which is F2 hybrid lethality. So if you look at the Nasonia phylogeny and compare it to the relationships of the microbiomes, they parallel each other. But we're dealing with Nasonia vitropenis and Nasonia peralta that diverged about a million years ago and have been classically studied from a genetics perspective to find what are the genes that control the severe F2 hybrid lethality or inviability relative to a viable one. So here's the average number of individuals produced by parental crosses. You get about 30 to 40 offspring, as I mentioned previously. But in the hybrid production, most of the death occurs in the larval state and drops significantly. And we see this phenotype here, which is a hypermelanization response. And it hadn't occurred to us that, that this is probably a microbial that leads actually to the death. Once we saw the phylosymbiotic pattern, we thought let's measure the microbiomes in these hybrids and start to figure out if something is going differently in these dead hybrids where the melanism. Is. But the backstory here is that for 10 years, Nasonia geneticists have been trying to find the QTL regions on the five chromosomes of Nasonia for what controls the inviability. So it's a little bit of an odd thing to now say let's go look at the microbes, unless there's a fundamental interaction here between the genome and the microbiome. Okay, so when you measure the microbiomes of the larvae again, now with high throughput sequencing, uh, we start to get <clears throat> patterns that are consistent with phylosymbiosis, and this is occurring in the larval state just before hybrid death. The genotypes of the species are shown here, so the hybrids are shown as genotypes that have both species genomes and the F2 hybrids. So I want to draw your attention to two parts. 
One is is the draw time on performance money for binance are more similar to each other than I guess the market And the long cornice draw time hybrid microbiome looks fairly similar to the longicornis microbiome. There's no hybrid lethality in this young species cross. The F2 hybrids live. And we see a pattern where the hybrid microbiome looks like one of the parents, which is interesting in and of itself. But if you look at the older species pair between Vitropenis and Geralti, their microbiome looks distinctly different from the Geralti and Vitropenis parental microbiomes. And we measured these microbiomes just before lethality in early larval development. So it looks like there's already a cocktail of microbes here that's not similar to the parents that could underlie the lethality we're seeing. Let's do the causation experiment. There are four basic predictions here. Uh, hybrid Nasonia, non-hybrid Nasonia will live. Conventionally reared hybrid Nasonia will die. The germ-free hybrid Nasonia will live if the microbiome is responsible for eliciting part of the lethality. And the inoculated hybrid will die and exhibit the melanization response that we see in conventional rarity. Inoculation is taking bacteria native to Nasonia and putting it back into the germ-free Nasonia. Let's see if we can recapitulate the hybrid lethality if it's caused by the bacteria. We have to develop a germ-free rearing protocol for Nasonia. Uh, Nasonia are obviously parasitoids, so we had to take the host outside of itself, essentially. What we did is we have um, filters sitting on a meniscus layer of uh, fly hemolymph, uh, shown, in a, shown in a cartoon here, and we can progress development from eggs to pupae at a very high frequency. You do see that the development on this germ-free media is slowed by two to three days, and only 53% of the pupae actually survive this long. This is now Nasonia living without their microbes because we've supplemented antibiotics into the rearing. So under conventional rearing, the hybrid mortality is consistently at 80 to 90 percent, as you can see in these two middle crosses. Under germ-free rearing, the, the hybrid production is actually significant, non-significantly different from the parental hybrid production. There's probably a little bit difference there if we had higher sample sizes, but dramatically increases uh, with respect to the conventional hybrid mortality. And then putting the bacteria back into these germ-free hybrids reinstates a significant amount of the lethality uh, that we see in the conventional rate. So I just want to pause here and think about what is the relative importance of genes versus microbes on this speciation event or this reproductive isolation trait. It's important to note that you can't get the hybrid lethality without the microbes. And you probably can't get the hybrid lethality without the genes which is the cornerstone of the whole genomic model, that the genetics of the organism requires both the microbiome and the genome. So we can have a standard model in which genetic mutations wedge one species into two. Certainly, we know of cases where species have been mapped to nuclear genomes. But I think also there's a role for taking two different species, in this case, microbe and animal, putting together to make third species. Um, so we have speciation through mergers of organisms. And we also have speciation where just the microbes cause speciation. So in terms of thinking about the genome microbiome merger, we have targeted the immune gene set as the host genome side of this problem of the F2 hybrid lethality. We'd like to know more about what nuclear genes are responsible for the hybrid lethality. So we've created an insect innate immune database. We've categorized um, annotated the Sony's immune gene data set, which is just shy of 500 immune genes and happens to now be the highest immune gene set categorized for insects. That's only because we looked really hard. I think if other folks re-annotated their genomes, they'd also increase the number of immune genes. We were uh, interested in asking how do these genes express themselves in hybrids to get a window into whether the genome portion of this lethality is, is, is associated with the microbiome problem. So, in conventional hybrids, uh, you see that the immune system is hyper-expressed relative to the genome. In the inoculated hybrids, we see the same thing. So whenever the bacteria is present, either conventionally or inoculated, there's no significant difference between the two. There's a relative hyper-expression of the immune system relative to the genome. When we remove the microbes, these immune genes are now uh, less expressed significantly. 
compared to the conventional way of not doing it. And interestingly enough, one of the large classes of immune genes that are shut down in these germ freeze are serine proteases. And serine proteases, take a half here. Yeah, so serine proteases sit at the top of the signaling cascade for, for propanyl oxidase. Propanyl oxidase is what launches the melanization of these molecules. So serine proteases sit here. Um, if you have hyperexpression of the serine proteases, you have hyperactivation of the propanyl oxidase, which would lead to melanin production. If you have low expression, let's say in the germ free hybrids, you get low expression of the propanyl oxidase, low melanin amounts. Now let's remember have candidate regions that are mapped for these types of genes. So one of the extra things we did in this work was take the new genes that localize to the predicted QTL regions of the microbiome. And we took three candidates in this case, uh, localized on different chromosomes, and just asked if these QTL regions are present in dead hybrids, what happens to them in the germ-free hybrids? So this is the allele distribution of the visual medicine for all by allele functionality markers. Now under Mendelian ratios, you expect with no lethality, 50% V allele, 50% G allele on the hybrids. But if hybrids are dying because one allele causes more mortality than the other, you'll get a transmission ratio dispersion that you see an increase in one particular allele. That's what we see in the conventional. You see that also mirrored in Sorry, this is expected data from the previous publication. This is what we observed in the lab. And then in the germ free, we restored this marker ratio transmission distortions back to 50 50 in the Mendelian like ratio because there's no, well, there's no hybrid mortality. All right. Okay, so this, as I mentioned, we have these gene candidates that are hyper expressed or hypo expressed, and we're going to start knocking down these gene candidates in the areas of the hybrid lethality. Our prediction is that if we knock these genes down, we'll also be able to rescue the hybrid mortality, just like removing the microbiome rescued the mortality. It would take two to tango. If you don't have both, you don't get the mortality. If you have one versus the other, you don't get the mortality. So it's, a gene, it's kind of like a, a, a gain and loss experiment, whether it's on the genome side or the microbiome side. So a summary uh, is that we've uh, narrowed in an Asonia serendipitously, uh, only because I think we're asking the question. I don't think Nasonia is special, but we have a case here of Wabaki induced isolation, the narrow sense model where only Wabaki is required, and then in the F2 generation we have a case of hologenomic uh, reproductive isolation. So, you know, I guess my question for, for all of us is, what if we started looking at hybrids and the antibiotic curing of these hybrids in standard systems where speciation has been documented or hybrid sterility and viability has been documented, will we find this? And it's just the difference between asking the question versus not is what has made the discovery of speciation by symbiosis not as uh, not as prominent yet as speciation genetics. Okay? And so the basic prediction is if you take, whether it's the Sony or any system, a nuclear hybrid incompatibility, uh, and you look at these hybrids, they will always be incompatible and you cannot rescue, sorry, the conventional hybridization has reduced hybrid survival, and they will always be reduced hybrid survival if you wear them under a germ free wear. That is, it's only a nuclear genetic interaction. You can't rescue that. However, a whole genome of incompatibility <coughs> is where you can rescue that. If you would do a little bit of modeling that we've done, you can predict that the number of possible hybrid incompatibilities by adding the microbiome into this model here gives us more red lines, which are more negative epistatic interactions or incompatibilities. So the propensity for evolving speciation by symbiosis is actually greater than the propensity for speciation just by the nuclear genome. Okay, outside of Nasonia, I've mentioned a few cases where we know about microbes driving speciation. I'll leave you with a few more thoughts. So we talked about the Drosophila polystorum case. We talked about recent subclinaria. Melanogaster and simulants, uh, there are nuclear pore genes that have been mapped by uh, David Presgraves that are involved in F2 hybrid lethality. Those nuclear pore genes could be portals for viruses to come in through the nucleus. And we don't quite know why those hybrids are dying, but it could be that they, the gene that's been documented in the Zansky Muller incompatibility is in fact interacting with the viruses that can invade those pores. That's a little speculative. Um, 
consider the aphids. There are thousands of aphid species. They all have nutritional endosymbionts called glutamira. So plant sap is a nutrient deficient diet. These aphids could, would not be on planet Earth if they didn't have their glutamira symbionts supplementing those nutrients that are missing. And uh, divergence in the glutamira symbionts, in theory, could drive divergence in the populations and their resources in which plants they feed on. Sort of an ecological isolation principle associated with symbiosis. Arabidopsis, uh, there's a really cool study out by Kirsten Bombley's lab many years ago, maybe five or six years ago, uh, where they showed that if you take Arabidopsis populations and you interbreed them, you can get these kind of small hybrids. Um, and these hybrids have been genetically analyzed, and the genes that cause this hybrid uh, sort of, uh, size problem is, in fact, mapped to immunity genes in the plant. Plant nucleus. So when when a speciation genesis maps a, a, a speciation gene to an immune gene, they're essentially mapping a speciation by symbiosis process. You cannot look at an immune gene without understanding the microbes that it's interacting with. So what I would argue that every time we find an immune gene, it, and we map it to the genome, despite some of the quotes that I presented earlier about the fact that we've got those that map to proteins, I would argue if they map to immunity, it is example of speciation by symbiosis. Perhaps we can discuss that. And then the last provocative thing where I'll stick my neck out so you can chop it is humans, if you look at the lineage specific changes that occur in the human genome relative to hominids, the immune genes are off the charts in terms of how much positive selection and adaptive evolution occurs in the immune system. Moreover, there have been key genes that have been lost in the immune system that all hominids have. Possible that human, the origins of humans was in part driven by an infectious origin, okay, where something that challenged the human population led to this incredible adaptive evolution of the immune system, okay, and that might have separated us from our species. One small piece of evidence is that they've taken a hominid gene that hasn't been deleted from Homo sapiens, or has been deleted from Homo sapiens, and they put that gene into uh, human cells. It's an immune gene. And that immune gene then makes those cells more hypersusceptible to infection. I'll do it with that. Symbiosis, it is common. Um, we're getting, I would say it's common, but we're getting more evidence that it, it's not going to be just a specific phenomenon to Nisum. So Howard Ackman's lab published this paper in 2010 where the divergence of the mitochondrial genomes correlates with the patterns of the microbiota and hominids really well. Hydra is uh, another case where they've done really well-controlled laboratory studies of several different species of Hydra, and the nuclear phylogeny parallels the dead of the Hydra. Wild populations of ants, uh, Naomi Pierce's lab has found that something, you know, over 20 different spe uh, species of ants show the same phylosymbiotic pattern um, uh, as in the nuclear gene. Okay, so where, where do we sort of go in this, in this seminar? Um, we started with the question of Darwin and what he necessarily couldn't contribute to at the time. We talked a little bit about the history between speciation genetics and symbiosis surrounding this question. And we've talked about cases where each one of these has played a role in reproductive isolation. You can have speciation genes, you can have speciation microbes driving the process like Wolbachia or you could have a genome by microbiome process. And with that, I'd like to just summarize some principles of the whole genome that I think are worth discussing maybe at the super bash after this as we drink and we get silly. So uh, if you study this thing, you start to realize, yes, you know, the, the, the evidence for the microbiome is overwhelming and playing an adaptive role in health and fitness. So the whole genome emphasizes that it's a newly appreciated unit of selection, where the genome and the microbiome together form a unit of selection that doesn't obviate any other units of selection, but it is a unit of selection. Um, it's careful to distinguish this principle from other jargon works like superorganism, organ, or metagenome. What we're talking about is an assembly of diverse organisms that forge a vital and synergistic interaction. We cannot live without our microbes, and that is not a superorganism, which tends to be many individuals of one species, it's certainly not an organ of cells, and it's not a metagenome. It's an assembly of the host-specific organisms that forge an animal.
This idea fits squarely into symbiosis and multi-level selection theory by adding a new unit of selection. Um, the, the whole genome does not change evolution of biology in any serious way. It just upgrades it to include the microbiome as part of the genetics of the host organism. I would argue that evolution is extremely complex, and we should not dumb it down by just looking at the nuclear genome as the only stuff of evolutionary biology. Um, it fits into all canonical mechanisms of evolution, from disequilibria, host specificities, um, maternal transmission, and selection, and so forth. And finally, there are a number of ways in which variation in the whole genome can arise and be selected upon. Okay. I think uh, Rob Brucker, who's moving on to a um, junior fellow position at Harvard, actually next week, um, who's done the majority of all this work, and also several others in the lab who helped us along the way, and an NSF grant to facilitate uh, this work. Uh, so thank you for listening. You were fair by not asking questions, so I can take them uh, if you have any questions. Yes. Well, that I love that question um, because I think there's an active debate by some folks that say let's move beyond mitochondria being an organelle. Let's just call it for what it is. It's a bacteria. And as people study bacterial endosymbiont genomes, they find that the size of endosymbiont genomes is getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where you know, things are going to leave at some point. The mitochondria looks like bacterial endosymbionts. And so biology does have to confront this idea that the endosymbionts are bacteria, and mitochondria are 